The Burden Boys by John Hayes. There's a small town buried in the California desert where boredom can be fatal. Maybe 10,000 people total live there, battling the constant enemies of 100 degree heat. Dust that clogs and chokes everything in sight. And a landscape that runs from rust colored to burn umber with not much in between. The locals refer to it as shit town, and I can't say they're wrong. There's not much you can do about the heat or the dust, but the local kids do have a uh, unique cure for the boredom. Now during the week it's quiet because there ain't much you can do except get in each other's business in a half-hearted sort of way and, and work on your car. But as the Friday night approaches, the teenagers start getting real jittery and ornery like a junkie itching for a fix. And arguments spark over nothing at all. No one talks about it. But what they're all feeling is that loose, liquid sensation you get in the pit of your stomach when you get just a little bit too close to the edge of a canyon and you dare yourself to have a little look. And then it's Friday. And as the sun dips under the mountains, turning the desert sand blood red, they all start gathering up in their souped up cars in the parking lot outside the Stater Brothers. Now, the only ones who argue and bullshit now are the new guys, here for the first time, who have no idea what's coming. You can spot the regulars easy. Now, they're the ones with the hollowed out eyes who just sit on the edge of their cars, drinking and smoking whatever they got to take the edge off. Cassie Dean shows up around 11 driving that fire apple red Camaro she's built so many times her prints are on every bolt. She mooches around shooting the shit and testing the tension in the air making sure to ratchet it up if it's too low and ease it down a notch if it's getting a little heated. No one mentions Yates Field even though it's what they're all thinking because this is Cassie's show now and without her, it can't happen. Say the wrong thing and she is gone. Now those nights are bad. That's when kids drink themselves blind out of pure frustration and everyone starts looking for someone to blame. That's how Caleb Jacobson got stabbed and nearly bled out in the parking lot. But tonight, everyone's cool. Even the new guys. And when midnight rolls around, everyone holds their breath, waiting for the word. Then it comes. Gonna cruise out on a Yates Field, Cassie announces. <laughs> Who's down? <laughs> now some bitch out. They pair up and light out and go and find a quiet spot where two bodies can get personal and safety. Then there's that few with that itch that sex just won't scratch, who climb into their cars, spark the engines, and follow Cassie's Camaro up the River Ridge Way past the burned out buildings on Yates Road and out onto the charred fields beyond. Now you gotta time it just right so you hit a certain field at a particular time. And the only person who can do it for sure is Cassie. Now it took her months to figure out exactly when and exactly where you gotta be to get them running. But it's not just that. There's something else she does when she's found that spot. It's some kind of ritual, but she don't share that information with anybody. Tonight, we hit that big top field just as the moon clears a thick bank of clouds and lights up the corn. It sways, listening, or maybe watching, as Cassie walks out in the burnt out clearing in the center of the field, waving at us to stay out till she's done. She kneels, and I see her take a box from her pocket and open it and she takes something from it that wriggles. Then she does something to it, and I can't see exactly what, and then it's over. She stands and faces all us possibles, lined up at the edge of the field, and she walks back, big shit-eating grin on her face. <laughs> now the first person she comes to is my girl, Kayla. First date, Cassie asks. Well, it was either this or a movie, Kayla asks, says, playing it off real cool. What kind of movies do you like? <laughs> Scary ones, Kayla replies. The scarier, the better. Cassie's eyes glitter. 
She turns to me and says, I knew blood. They'll like that if they catch you. But if they don't, she trails off and I follow her eyes as they roam over Kayla's curves. Be a hell of a first day. I try and hide my nerves by sparking a joint. It don't work. You gonna bitch out again? Cassie challenges me as I cough out smoke. <coughs> Try me. <laughs> I reply, hoping Kayla doesn't catch the slight tremor in my voice. Cassie smiles and then turns to the next possible as I hand Kayla the joint. She takes a hit and listens to Cassie mess with the guy, but I don't bother paying attention because I know decisions have already been made. I'm racing tonight, no matter what. Ten minutes later, I slide in behind the wheel, and I don't look at Kayla next to me. Because if I do, she'll see how scared I am. Now I ease the car into the field and let it jog across the ruts and past Cassie, who's walking back to the edge to walk. <coughs> and then I hit the middle of the field, and I rev the engine. Nothing. So I rev it again, harder, and I spin my wheels, making that rear end fishtail, tearing it up as the field to provoke the inhabitants. Kayla's looking around, hoping to spot something. <coughs> Don't waste your time, I tell her. You can't see them head on, only in the mirrors. She stares at me, then fixes her gaze on the big rear view that I had mounted special. It's so big, practically widescreen, so when she stares into it, hoping to see something. <coughs> this is bullshit, right? She asks. But before I can reply, something rustles in the corn. Way off on the right, and I don't wait. I just drop that shifter in the first, and I bury the big pedal. The car's pointed forward at the far edge of the field, away from Cassie and the others, and it leaps forward with a roar as petrol explodes deep in its gut, kicking us forward. My heart's pounding because I can hear them hissing and screaming in the corn as they run for us. Kayla's hollering at me, but she can't see anything, but I know they're almost on us. I can feel that heat rising. And then in the rear view, I see them. The burning boys. They explode from the corn, spitting fire, screaming and hissing, long arms and fingers reaching as their twisted, burning legs pump, trying to catch up to us. We woke them, and now they're coming. Dozens of them, all burning, all hungry, all dead. The race is on. I don't see nothing, she yells at me, staring out the back window. Check the rear view, I yell back. You can't see him by looking straight on. And that's all she gets, because I'm focused on keeping the wheel straight as it bucks out of my hand. I pour on all the speed I can, because they're catching up, and the rising heat's making my heart pound so hard I can feel that sharp stabbing pain in my left arm. Kayla's screaming, because she's got her eyes locked on that big rear view, and I can see them. Burning boys, catching up. I can hear them hiss and scream. And she knows everything I told her is true. And then if I mess up, if they catch us, we'll burn too. The Speedo's me touching 50, and I'm starting to panic, because them boys can't really move. They're rotting our ass and fixing to catch us. And if they do, they will school us on the dangers of waking the restless dead. Be cool, I tell myself, even though it's got to be touching 100 degrees in there. Be Cool, I say again, and I try and ignore Kayla, who is bellowing in my ear. Because we're hitting 60 in the middle of the field at midnight, surrounded by wild corn so high, I can't see a damn thing beyond the two round ovals of my headlights. Now what I know is the ground's treacherous with potholes, tree stumps, and rocks, and I'm praying I didn't drink or smoke too much to handle this shit. Randy Delacroix flashes into my mind. That big mouth asshole who tried to run with the boys last summer and flipped that sweet pickup of his into the corn and burned. Kayla's yelling at me to go faster because she can see him gaining and I risk a look in the rear view and I wish to God that I had him because they're almost on us and I swear the one at the very front is Randy. It's cool, I tell myself. This is how it goes. It don't matter how fast you drive or how well you know the ground. The burning boys always gain. This is their place, but I know, I know, I judged it right. I know we'll make it to the edge before they catch us. And then I hear the sharp sound of 
thin fingers, stretch at the paintwork on my left, and I feel a blast of heat on my side of my face, so intense it makes me wince. I snap a look right into the rear view and see the burning boys all along the car. They are drooling fire as they claw at the paintwork, their fingers burning, scoring deep ruts in the metal. There's no way to be. They're all around us, and oh sweet Jesus, I scream, they're inching in front! Randy's burning head leers at me, and he's not alone. Jester Boy, Marcus Weaver, and Cassie's little brother Jonah are all there, screaming as they burn, running with the rest of the boys, and I finally give it to the pack, because I know now that in a heartbeat they'll be in front of us, and we'll be joining them. I fucked up! And then... The front end lifts, and we are flying. I holler at Kayla that we made it as the low earth bank that marks the border of Yates Field, the one the burning boys can't get beyond, picks us up and throws us out of that corn. My teeth clack down hard enough that I taste blood, and the wheels slam onto the cracked tarmac of the River Ridge Road. But we're still going 60. At the edge of the road is honest, for I can even think straight. I stamp on them brakes and wrestle the wheel hard left, praying that I can get the car under control before I flip it. It's close, but hell, <coughs> tonight's our lucky night. And the brakes bite down, smoke squealing from them tires. And we lay about ten feet of rich black rubber on that cracked road before we finally judder to a halt. We made it. I look in the rear view at the Yates Field just in time to see them dance in flames the burning boys disappear into the corn. They're gone, I tell Kayla, who's in shock in the passenger seat. We made it. I look out the window and I see the stars overhead are sharper and more perfect than ever. I take a deep drag of the air, and it tastes sweeter and more wholesome than I can remember. Then, Kayla is on me, her hands tearing at my Levi's, and I realize I am sporting a regular railroad spike. She frees me as I tear off her clothes, ripping her pants off, clawing at her like she's clawing at me. And then I'm inside her for the first time, and it is good. And I know, even as we fuck, that we'll both be back next Friday, because this is living.